the kids as part of our service. Um, I love, I love little squeals in the service and little, like, they can't, if we can't have the people of God with the family of God here, where are we going to have them? Like, doesn't Jesus love children? He, he does. Uh, and uh, we need to love and, uh, and care for our children. I just love them as a part of our service. We're going to do Question Box Sunday. Um, question Box Sunday might be new to you, but it's, for me, it's 30 years of Question Box Sundays. I, I, there's a couple of ground rules with Question Box Sundays. Um, there's no stupid question, uh, and I, I never disclose who asked me the question. So just be careful when you talk about it, because the person that you were talking to might be the one who answered the question, who asked the question. And uh, I've I've had many questions. There's some questions which are just fun to think through, like did Adam and Eve have a have a belly button? Well, it's a good question, isn't it? Like you think, but that's one of the sort of questions where I'm content that if I get it wrong here, and one day I'm going to see Adam and Eve, and go, ah, look, I was wrong. But that's okay, we can laugh about that. But there's some questions, of course, which we don't have the luxury to be so flippant about. Uh, did Jesus rise from the dead? I mean, that, that's, that is a question that actually touches people's eternity, doesn't it? And so, but I love Question Box Sundays. I've had questions like, uh, is it okay for Christians to have tattoos, uh, abortion, homosexuality? All different questions. Um, some, of, some of the most obscure uh, Bible readings people have been reading, they've got a question, and so they, they pose one of the questions. Uh, so I love Question Box Sundays. It's, it's, uh, particularly during these sort of holiday periods, it's good for us to have a bit of a... We can ponder together. And I guess that's what I'm trying to do. Let's ponder together. We've got three questions today. Um, what right does Satan have or think he has in Matthew 4 to give Jesus all the kingdoms of the world? That's a great question, isn't it? The second question is, why did God allow Hezekiah to live another 15 years simply by asking? And Isaiah 38, that's obviously one of those questions. Someone was reading Isaiah 38 and they thought, well, how come he just asks and he gets? And uh, we are told that COVID has changed culture and society. What effect does it have? on us as the people of God and how we live out our faith. Um, so we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to touch on these. Um, my aim is not for you to go away with, with the one complete answer that will... You know, what we're doing is pondering, we're wondering, we're holding up the scriptures to help us understand um, life and society and how we are to live today. So, as we think of the first question, what right does Satan have or think he has in Matthew 4 to give Jesus all the kingdoms of the world? So I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 4. <coughs> Just a reminder, this is uh, when Jesus is in the wilderness. And uh, Matthew chapter 4 says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter said to him, came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he says, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up into their, in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to the very high mountain, and this is where our questions focused, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendour. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angel came and attended him. Angels came and attended him. 
don't think that this is just some sort of uh, role play that Jesus did. That uh, it, these are true temptations. The, these are these are temptations, and we get a bit of a glimpse into these three temptations, but we don't know how many more there were, and but we really don't know the depth of this these temptations because if we all have faced the temptations of Satan, and too often we we fail at. But imagine Jesus being tempted in these ways, and it, it's, we need to remember this is this is very real. The first thing that we need to remember is Satan is a liar, isn't he? John chapter eight verse forty-four: You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So it's good for us to remember right up from the start that Satan is a liar. But do you know what the best lie is? The best lie is when it's closest to the truth, isn't it? When, when, there, is, when there is sort of 90% truth in something and then a 10% lie, that's, that is the most powerful lie. And there is some truth into Satan's claims. We, uh, we think back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, where we see that the proper and proper rulers of the world were to be us. We were to be human beings. We were to, we were to rule the world. We were to, to steward the world. And of course, when we, we failed and the, the great fall happened, we see that somehow there was some sort of power that Satan did achieve. There was some, there was some sort of, he almost took humanity in as captives, as slaves. And, but right from the start, God made it very clear that even though that this happened, he wasn't going to allow it to happen. There was going to be a seed, a seed from the woman who was going to finally defeat the seed of, of the serpent. There was going to be this great war, but finally the serpent will be defeated. And Jesus does recognise Satan. He uses the words, the prince of this world, in, in John chapter 12, 31, John chapter 14, 30, and 16, 11. So Jesus does recognise that there is some sort of authority that Satan has, but of course it's always limited authority under God. There is some sort of limit to the authority. The temptation here for Jesus in the wilderness is to avoid the suffering that was going to come ahead. You are going to have... So, so Jesus, you don't have to go through the suffering. You can shortcut this. You can get to the very purpose of, of having all things under your authority. You can do that simply by getting down and worshipping me. Do that, and I will give you what you want. We have an expression for that, don't we? The ends justify the means. So it must have been a temptation. Like, Jesus knew about the suffering servant. Jesus knew he was going to go to the cross. Get down on your knees, worship me, and you don't have to do that. If Jesus had done that, of course, we would not have a saviour. We wouldn't have been sharing the communion together, would we? We would have, the victory would have been Satan's. And we need to remember here what's at stake. In, in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, we see the, the end goal. The, the seventh angel sound his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven which said the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ and he will reign forever that's the, the aim of God to bring everything under Christ but what happens when the Christ actually gets down and worships the Satan the victory would have been lost before Jesus went to the cross he explained to his disciples in chapter uh, John chapter 14, 23. I've told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you'll believe. I will not speak with you much longer, 
for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on, he has authority. He has no hold on me. But the world must learn that I love the Father and I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. leave. Because of the blood of Jesus, I too can say, Satan has no hold over me. I follow Jesus. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus, uh, Satan has no hold over, over Jesus, and because Jesus is my Lord, Satan has no claim over me and you if you follow Jesus. The only authority that he can have is when I give him authority, when I, when I give him the temptation. I give him an authority. But the wonderful thing is we're... we're we're encouraged to repent, ask for forgiveness. So if you're a child of God, you stand in the blood of Jesus and you're safe from Satan, and that's a great place to be. It's our first question. So let's just, um, just have a think about it. Any further questions you may have? Well, if you have any other questions... Why don't you write the question down, put it in the question box and uh, in the offering box, and maybe one day we'll get to them again. That's my first attempt and the first question. Second question, why did God allow Hezekiah, he is the king of Israel, of Judah, to live another 15 years simply uh, by asking, in Isaiah verse 38. You remember the story of Hezekiah? Hezekiah was actually one of those good kings, um, which... There weren't many good kings in, in Israel or Judah. He was one of those good kings. He did a few silly things on the way, but he was a good king. He trusted God. And this happened around a time when there's a, this king of Assyria named Sennacherib. He was encircled Jerusalem. And they were going to, he wanted to wipe out Jerusalem. Now, in those walled cities of old, you, you know, You've probably all seen Lord of the Rings and sort of stuff, and you know how quickly the, uh, the, the walled city comes down. Well, it, it wasn't like that at all. It was, it'd take months for, for a walled city to be captured. Do you know how they did it? They encircled the city. They cut off all the food in and out. They would starve the city out. They would build ramparts, and finally they would breach the walls and go in and destroy. But... During that time, could you imagine the fear, the terror, the horror? Even the Bible talks about times when this happened, mothers eating their own children, like cannibalism, because, because there was no food. It's hard for us to imagine. But there was no food and there was a lot of terror and a lot of sickness. So let me read from Isaiah chapter 38. Verses 1 to 6. In those days Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, this is what the Lord says, put your house in order because you're going to die, you're not going to recover. That's a bit of good news from the prophet, isn't it? <laughs> I wonder if you do that. the prophets had to do that very often. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, Remember, Lord, how I've walked with you faithfully in wholehearted devotion and, and, and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, Go and tell Hezekiah, This is what the Lord, the God of your father David says, I've heard your prayers and seen your tears. I've had 15 years to your life and I'll deliver you in this city from the hands of the king of Assyria, I will defend this city. What do you think? Hezekiah turns his head to the wall, prays, has a bit of a cry, and uh, God says, okay, I'll give you another 15 years. In chapter 37, we would see, we, there's an account of the downfall of Sennacherib, how they, uh, how they, didn't, how they did not defeat Jerusalem. But chapter 38 is not, it's not chronological. That's actually during the actual siege. This, is, this was happening during the siege of Jerusalem. The setting for, that's where 
The setting for uh, chapter 38 is found in those weeks or months of that siege where the armies surrounded Jerusalem. There was a lot of sickness. And here we have the king so sick he's going to die. But take a look at verse 6. Have you got verse 6 up? Uh, 5, 6, yes. Have a look at verse 6 carefully. Hezekiah's salvation from death is linked closely with Jerusalem's salvation. You see that? The sickness of the king leading to death was almost a picture of what was happening to the city. The city was sick, leading to death. The, the, the king was sick, leading to death. Their destinies were linked. And the king was often the one who was the representative of the, of the city or of the nation. And we see here a picture of what was going to happen to the nation. After Hezekiah was uh, restored, he writes a poem which comes after, after this event in uh, chapter 38. But I want to go to verse thir- 17. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. Now, think, remember he was sick. In your love you kept me from the pit of destruction. You put all my sins behind my back. This could apply to Hezekiah. It could apply to the nation of Israel. Actually, it applies to both. Here we see Hezekiah turning to God in in repentance and prayer, humbly asking God for, for salvation. And in doing so, God brought salvation not just to Hezekiah, but to the city of of Jerusalem. So Hezekiah asked and lived another 15 years. He was uh, a godly king. He did a few silly things. It's all there for you to read. But I do wonder if in, imagine 14 years and 11 months later, um, would he be asking God for another five years? (laughs) Well, that went that fifteen years went really quick. Maybe it's another five years. But let me give you a couple of observations. In the Old Testament, there was not a clear understanding of life after death. There wasn't a clear understanding. There was you go down to the down to, to the grave and who knows what happens then. We in the New Testament have a much better understanding of life after death. We uh and we who are part of the, of the new covenant, we need to remember we need, something that we need to continue to remember, that death is not the worst thing that could happen to us. Death is not the worst. In fact, Romans says that death, where is your sting? We may experience death, but that's not the worst. But I think God does want us to call out to him to ask for healing. We, we've, you know, Pauline mentioned, you know, we've, we've been asking for healing. And so we do need to, you know, we, we're invited to do this. But as we've even remembered this morning, the Jesus, our Lord, he asked for this cup to be removed from him. But the answer was no. But Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. So somehow, God's healing is not so much just to make our lives a bit better, but I think it's, there's a bigger picture involved here that we always need to be aware. So second question. How are we going time? We're going well with time, I think. Yeah, you might have other questions to think about. It's, it's, these are really interesting, thoughtful things we, we, we can say. So thank you for those who ask the questions. The third question is, we're told that COVID has changed culture and society. No one would argue against that, would they? What effect does that have on us as the people of God and how we live our faith? As I work with a lot of churches all around the Western Sydney, this is one of the big questions for us all. How does, how does, how does the community of people of God, as we move forward, act post-COVID, post all these things that are happening in our world. We, we see huge disruptions. We've got wars and we've, we've got all these terrible things happening. 
this is one of the big questions, but I, I think it's really helpful for us if we go back and understand actually the bigger picture, the big picture of what's happening here. So on my screen, we're going to show you a picture of the present age. The next slide. Let's imagine this is our present age, the, the, the evil age we're in, where, where creation, we were created, and everything is beautiful, everything is perfect, sin came into the world, and we're going along in this present age present age. The Bible talks about the present age. Um, there's evil in the world, there's injustice, there is violence, there is abuse. But there's also beauty, isn't there? There, there is beauty and there's wonder and there's some good things. But the, but the next slide shows the kingdom of God. Jesus talks about how it's broken into this age, this present age. It, it's, it's come forcefully. It's it's like that. Uh, it's like that strong man that Jesus talks about, who enters the house forcefully. And the kingdom of God is in this present age, where Jesus is the King. Jesus is King. The, the cross and the and the, the resurrection of Jesus shows who the King is. And Jesus taught us to pray, "Your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven." I used to think the kingdom of God was like this. Next slide. That somehow the, the kingdom of God was way up there somewhere, up in heaven, and we're down here. But, but very clearly, Jesus talks about the kingdom of God breaking into this age, here on earth. And that's always been the picture, to have, have heaven and earth together where God and human beings live. If you think about in the Garden of Eden, and you think about in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. So don't think of it somehow the kingdom of God is somewhere up there. The kingdom of God is here as we live out our lives of faith following Jesus the King. But the next slide shows you really the end of the present evil age will happen when Jesus returns. When Jesus comes back, we, 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 the, the, the present evil age will end. But where are we? We're in between here and here. That's our present experience. We are people who follow Jesus, Christians, from we're, we're, we're sort of in these two kingdoms, these two ages. And the Bible talks about the, the, about these two ages and um, a lot of scholars, a lot of writers talk about the now and not yet. What we experience now of something of the kingdom of God is we have each other. We, we have community, we have, we have forgiveness, we, we have love, we, we, we share things together, we, we actually are blessed because we are acting out the, the king, we are being a part of the kingdom of God here on earth as it's in heaven. But we are foreigners in this world. We, we are sojourners. We, we're not of this world. We don't belong here. We don't belong in this present evil age, although we're a part of it for now. There's a tension. We are a part of God's family, God's kingdom. We're not alone. We, we have the presence of God with us. We have the Holy Spirit in us so that we might feel or realise that we are part of God's kingdom. But we live in this tension. Now, I bet you've noticed that bad, difficult things happen, uh, natural and unnatural disasters happen to Christians and non-Christians alike. Earthquakes happen, and it's, just, it's not just the non-Christians that get their, head, their houses shaken and fallen down, it's the, the Christians as well. Floods happen, we've had floods. People from our church, you know, have been affected by floods. You know, the, the water didn't go around your house because you're a Christian. We, we are together. We're in, this, we're in this era of time where heaven and earth, we're, we're in this present evil age. I mean, right throughout history, Christians have suffered. You remember um, when Priscilla and Aquila, uh, were found, who we read in 1 Corinthians, they were the ones who were sent out from Rome. So Rome decided to get rid of all the Jews. They expelled all the Jews. And of course, Priscilla and Aquila got caught up with that. They got disrupted. 
their life, their finances, their, their houses, they lost, like everyone else. In 70 AD, um, Rome actually did go around Jerusalem and for, for weeks and months sieged it and they slaughtered everyone. And the Christians that were there, they died or got taken into captive just like any other one else. Earthquakes, tsunamis, famine, war, disease, COVID-19. We are not isolated from any of these things. We're not isolated from our society. And Christians die. They, they, they suffer financial loss. They have hardship. We know this, don't we? Because we're a part of this present evil age. It's really important for us as believers, I think, is not to get some idea that somehow that God will save us from these things. He has saved us from the greatest thing, sin and death. He has saved us and will we'll be taken to be with him. We've been saved. But don't think that we will somehow be saved from having our lifestyles inconvenienced. Jesus tells us to be obedient in whatever circumstances. And I've been thinking a lot about COVID and, and what's been happening in the last few years. COVID has trained us, society has trained us to be anxious people, more anxious, more fearful. It's trained us. It's trained us to be scared to actually come together and to be... We, 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 we are trained to be isolated. We're safer when we're alone when we're in our homes. It's trained us to, to hoard things. Originally, it seems a long time ago, toilet paper. But probably more lately, in the last, is money. Let's store up money. Let's, let's make sure that we're going to be okay. It's it's trained us to be fear of com fear commitment because we can't make any dis make any plans because we don't know whether we can do it or not. Or so we've been afraid to commit. It's 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 caused us to be tired, hasn't it? Demands are put on us by ourselves and others, but we also have a fear of missing out. So we're always longing for something more or better, fearful that we're going to miss out. <coughs> the good news is that through faith we need not be anx anxious. We can take courage. Because we are children of God, we can trust him. We don't, well, I'm not saying we don't do the wise things about health, but let's not be t overly fearful. Let's Let's live like there is a resurrection and then we can actually take some faith risks because God's got us in the end. We are, so we need to meet regularly together on a Sunday and other times. We need, it's a part of our humanity, but it's also a part of our calling as the people of God. We are called not to hoard, but to be generous. We need to be generous in the way we support the mission of the church. We need to be generous in the way we support our chaplains to do remarkable things. In the next couple of months, do you realise that the government will probably make a decision whether to fund chaplaincy or not? So will our mission to the schools, chaplains, be dependent upon whether the government says it's okay for us to do it or not? Or are we going to maybe be generous and fund that ourselves if it came to that? We, uh, we need to be more generous with each other, our time, our lives. We need to reshape what it means to be committed to each other as a church. Because we've been trained to fear, to hide, to isolate and to hoard. A commitment to each other is, is always best expressed in, in, as we come together as the people of God. 
you've probably heard on the radio they talk about the decline of volunteers in society, how society, there's, there's the rotaries and all the things have, have declined in volunteers. The same amount of volunteers have declined in churches, do you realise? But we're doing something much more than just a, a little a community service. We, we are serving God. And I just am a little bit, I just was reflecting on this. We've had the same amount of volunteers decline in our churches as we do in society. And that should not happen, should it? If we've got, if we've got a great reason to come together and to serve one another. Tiredness, I understand. But it's our responsibility to rest. And maybe we need to cut some things out of our life that does take our energy, that is only pretty temporary. And that may mean watching Netflix at 11 o'clock at night. But if you don't master your diary, your diary will master you and you'll be, you'll be robbed of strength and stamina for the work that you want to achieve. When it comes to fear of missing out, let's fear what's important. Let's, let's fear missing out on what's important. Let's fear on missing out on following Jesus and being, one, being with one another. Next term, we're going to be exploring what it does mean as a community. And we're going to be looking at uh, faith, hope and love. And next term, we're going to be looking at what this means as a community of the people of God in 2022 as we look into 2023. Three months left of this year. Can you believe it? Three months left. How are we going to prepare for 2023? What do we need to do? Because the Bible talks a lot about perseverance. We need to persevere in our faith. So I'm going to pray, and uh, let me uh, pray as we... Father, we're going to ask that you would... Um, that you would help us as we live in, this, in this, this era where the kingdom of God has come to earth. Lord, I want to pray that your people... as, as as they live out their lives, us as Hawkes Valley Baptists, as we live out our lives, we might truly, might truly do your will here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, would you give us the, the courage to, and the wisdom to know what to leave behind and the insight and the, and, and the, the vision to, to know what we need to take up as we move forward. But I want to pray that we'd all be like Hezekiah. We'll always turn to you and pray to you, humble, humble, um, humbly dependent upon you in our prayers, whether that's through tears or, or gladness. Lord, we know and trust that you will hear us so Lord, I pray your blessing upon us as we, as we ponder as a church. What does it mean for us to be the people of God moving from 2022 into 2023 in this world today? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me just stand for final blessing. Would you stand with me? To him who is able to keep you from stumbling present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Please uh, join us for uh, morning tea, tea and coffee and some fellowship.
Let's take it to Jesus.